So let us now consider the two integrals that we mentioned in the previous video and get our hands dirty and look at the Riemann sum of each of the two integrals. So first, let's start with the original integral, the one that looks more complicated. And again, I want to reiterate here that we assume all functions we are considering are not only differentiable, but their derivatives are also continuous. So let's take a partition of the interval from A to B. And to simplify the setup, we will take a uniform partition of this interval. So we will take delta x to be, of course, the width of each of our intervals given by the total length of the interval divided by n, where here n will be the number of rectangles, the number of intervals that we take. Then, of course, xi, the ith point of our partition will be given by 8 plus i steps of size delta x. And of course, i ranging from 0, giving us 8, up to n, giving us xn equals b. So we can now rewrite the interval from x0 to then x1, the first subinterval, then x2, x3, and so on, up to xn, which equals b. And again, I leave it up to you to check that when i0, well, this is obvious, when i0, x0 is a. And when i is n, you can check n times delta x gives you b minus a, a plus b minus a gives you b. So a is x0, and b is xn. Now again, we do not have to take a uniform partition. So dividing up the interval from a to b into n intervals of equal length, but just for simplicity of the argument, this is what we're going with. Now we can rewrite the integral as the limit of the corresponding Riemann sum. We could take any point inside of any interval to evaluate our function f of g times g prime. Again, for simplicity of the argument, we will evaluate the function at the right end point of each interval. So then the integral from a to b of f of g of x times g prime of x dx will be equal to the limit as the number of rectangles tends to infinity, the sum from the first rectangle to the nth rectangle, the function at the right end point of the ith interval, therefore at xi, so giving us f of g of xi times g prime at xi times delta x. So this is the limit of the Riemann sum for the original integral. Now we want to consider the limit of the Riemann sum for the new integral. If you recall, this integral was the integral from g of a to g of b of f of u du. And u, of course, was equal to g of x. So we transform the original, so I can extend here, and say so this is the x-axis, the axis for the original variable of integration. But since now we make a transformation, letting u, the new variable, be g of x, we will obtain a new interval, as we saw before, ranging not from a to b, but from g of a to g of b. Now for simplicity, we will assume that the first derivative of g is positive, meaning that g of a will be less than g of b, assuming that a is less than b. Something else I forgot to mention, again, this is completely irrelevant. The argument works the same if a was greater than b, but again, for simplicity, let's assume that a is less than b. 
And again, for simplicity, let's assume that g prime is positive. Therefore, g is an increasing function. And so since a is less than b, then g of a will be less than g of b. You can see if g had a negative derivative, then g would be decreasing, and so g of a would now be greater than g of b. This would just flip the bounds of integration. Again, it makes no difference in the argument, and so for simplicity, we assume a is less than b, and g is increasing, so g of a is also less than g of b. So let us now con consider the partition of the new interval from g of a to g of b along the now new u-axis. So first we have g of a, the left-hand point, and g of b, the right-hand point. And now the key here is we don't have to start over from scratch and build a new partition of the new interval. We can instead notice that the interval from g of a to g of b will naturally inherit a partition from the partition of the interval from a to b along the x-axis, right? So a is sent to g of a. Again, since g is increasing, then x1 will be sent to g of x1, and since x1 is larger than a, g of x1 will be larger than g of a. Then x2 will be sent to g of x2, and again, assuming g is positive, g prime is positive, g is increasing, and so x1 is less than x2. And so g of x2 will be bigger than g of x1, and so on. x3 is sent to g of x3, up to xn is sent to g of xn, which is g of b. And of course, g of x0 is g of a. And so you see that, naturally, we obtain a partition of the new interval from g of a to g of b for free from the original partition of the interval from a to b along the, uh, the x-axis. Sorry. Now, this seems a bit heavy, so we will make the following definition. Let's ui equal g of xi. So this is g of x0, so it is u of 0, or sub 0. This is g of x1, u of 1, g of x2, u of 2, then g of x3, u of 3, up to g of xn, un, which is equal to b. And this is the key step in the argument, not building the partition along the u-axis of the new interval from scratch, but using the one that is inherited from the partition of the original interval from a to b along the x-axis. So now, with this partition, notice that something is interesting here. Initially, the partition along the x-axis was taken to be uniform, but g prime does not have to be constant. So this partition now does not have to be uniform. The length of each interval could vary from one to the other. So for this, we will not be able to just say delta u as the uniform length of each interval, but instead each interval has its own length, possibly, that we will call delta ui. This, of course, will be ui minus ui minus 1 the right-hand point of the interval minus the left-hand point of the interval. And now with this partition, we can rewrite the interval as a Riemann sum, well, the limit of the Riemann sum over this partition. So the integral from g of a to g of b of f of u du equals the limit there are still n parts, so as n goes to infinity, 
summing from the first part to the nth one. Again, we will take a Riemann sum at the right end point of each interval, so f at ui, the right end point of the ith interval, times, and again, not just delta x, as before, where we had a uniform partition, but because g prime may not be constant, we do not necessarily have a uniform partition, so times the length of the ith interval. It could be uniform, but not necessarily. So now we have our two integrals as limits of Riemann sums. We have the original integral and the new integral. Now we want to show that the difference between this integral and this one is equal to zero by showing that this expression minus this one will be equal to zero. So let's write that down. Now, it doesn't matter which one we write down first. So, let me write down the new integral first, but again, that is an arbitrary choice. So, we have the integral from g of a to g of b of f of u du minus the integral from a to b of f of g of x times g prime of x dx. This equals, and now we write each one as a limit of the corresponding Riemann sum, so limit as n goes to infinity, of the Riemann sum for the new integral, which was the sum from 1 to n of f of ui delta ui, minus the limit of the Riemann sum for the first integral, the sum, again, from 1 to n. Now, f of g of xi times g prime at xi times delta x. Now, because both limits exist, again, assuming the functions were continuous, then the limit of this expression minus the limit of this will be the limit of the difference of both Riemann sums. Right? This is a fundamental property of limits. the limit of the first Riemann sum minus the second Riemann sum. Now notice that in each case, we are summing as i goes from 1 to n, so we can rewrite this as a single summation of the difference of the corresponding terms. So the ith term of the first sum f of ui delta ui minus the corresponding ith term of the second sum. Now recall that ui is the same as g of xi, right? This was our shorthand for g of xi. So to simplify, we're going to rewrite this term as f of ui. And now we have f of ui being a common multiple. We can now factor it from the difference of two terms. We have f of ui times 
the left over delta u i minus g prime of x i delta x. So we're going to stop this video here, and in our next video, we will do some more work on this expression and show that, yes, indeed, the limit of this expression will equal zero. And so if this limit equals zero, then the difference here is equal to zero. Therefore, both the new integral and the original one have to be equal.